This is an oscillating pendulum. And this is the same pendulum moving backwards in time. Can you tell the difference? Well, no. The behavior of the pendulum does not change when you reverse time. In fact, if I show you a movie of any common evolving physical system, it seems like you can't say with 100% certainty whether the system moves forward or backward in time. And the reason for that is rather simple. Let's recall Newton's second law of motion. Force is proportional to acceleration. And acceleration is the second order derivative of displacement with respect to time. So x is a function of time t and t is assumed to move from left to right. That is, from the past towards future. What happens if we replace t by minus t, thus considering the same system moving backwards in time? By convention, derivative with respect to time is represented by a dot. The first derivative is minus x dot of minus t by chain rule. We calculate the second derivative using chain rule again and get minus minus x double dot, which is just x double dot of minus t. So if x of t is a solution to our equation, x of minus t is also a solution. Therefore, just by looking at any Newtonian process, it is simply impossible to say if it evolves forward in time or not. And this raises a serious philosophical challenge. How do we even know that time moves forward in our universe? We should think of a process which bears some memory of the direction of time. In this video we consider a dissolving substance such as a droplet of ink in a glass of water. It is natural to expect that as time goes forward, the ink will distribute uniformly around the cup and no big clusters could form. We will prove this observation mathematically and see exactly what quantity it tells us the direction of time. Generally, concentration is the amount of substance per unit volume. Amount simply means mass. In our case, it will be per unit length for simplicity, which means that our container is one-dimensional. Concentration is different at different points within our container, and it also changes with time. So it is a function of two variables, position x and time t. From this basic definition, you can get the expression for mass by simply rearranging the fractions. In our case, it is very similar. The mass of a substance across some interval from A to B at time t is equal to the integral of concentration with respect to distance from A to B. We want to look at how the mass changes with time, so we differentiate it. This quantity is called a mass flow. When we consider the mass flow over the cross-sectional area of the tube, we call it a flux. Flux Q, therefore, satisfies the following equation. The reason for introducing these quantities becomes more apparent when we turn back to our integral. For smooth functions, that is, functions without any sudden fluctuations, the derivative and integral sign can be interchanged. Wait a second, we have seen this quantity just now. Therefore, the integral is equal to the difference of flux at the endpoints. This is a principle of mass conservation. The rate of change of mass is simply the difference of flux at the endpoints. Now, what if we consider how concentration changes along our container, so with respect to the x variable? This is captured by the partial derivative with respect to x. Fick's law is an empirical postulate which states that this quantity, called the concentration gradient, is actually proportional to the flux. 
And it kind of makes sense, the bigger the concentration change is at a point, the bigger the mass change is at that point, and thus more mass flows, or rather fluxes through that point. Using Fick's law, our integral becomes the difference of gradients at the endpoints times some constant d. Don't worry, things are getting simpler now. We apply the fundamental theorem of calculus and differentiate with respect to b. The right-hand side becomes the second-order derivative. Here is where all applied mathematicians smile, because we have just derived the famous heat equation. This is because heat propagates in the same way as a dissolving substance does, in our example. We can solve this equation numerically and plot the concentration profile. Here I am using specific initial conditions and you can try the Python code yourself, the link is in the description. Anyway, this is how concentration looks like at some time t. This curve is at t plus delta t, and so on. It levels out, which again reminds us of how ink distributes uniformly around the cup. So what does it have to do with the time direction? Well, looking at these decaying curves, you might think about the slopes and how they become flat over time. We can sum the slopes across the entire curve, square them so that they don't cancel out each other, and if we do it for every point, it becomes an integral. This is called the Dirichlet energy. The slopes become more flat with time, so this energy decreases. Let's prove it. We differentiate it, and I don't want to bother you with calculations here, so here is what you get. This term accounts for contributions made at the boundaries of our container. But if it is sealed and no extra ink enters or escapes our cup, this term becomes zero. And this is a strictly negative value. So Dirichlet energy strictly decreases as time goes forward. We can visualize this by plotting concentration change again and see that the flatter the curve, the smaller the Dirichlet energy is. Now we have an exact proof that diffusion is not a process which is invariant under time reversal. And this is how dissolving ink demonstrates the direction of time.